again to all the mothers in attendance. We are honored by your presence. We recognize your labor of love, your sleepless nights, for you opening your hearts to us and your families. So we are blessed. God used the example of mothers in the Bible to represent himself several times, and uh, there is a reason for that. We could not have survived without you or kept our sanity, so we are grateful to have you in our lives. We hope you have a happy Mother's Day. All right, I'm just going to begin. So, Christ is risen. Can you guys know it's not a secret, right? Everyone here believes it? Everyone here believes that Christ is risen? Yes. I want you to know that saying that it's not something that we say. That actually characterizes us as who we are. This is the center of being a Christian that Christ is risen. We struggled for two months during Lent. We went through an amazing journey in Holy Week. We immersed ourselves in the walk of Christ. We read the story day by day. We had the long prayers and the hours in church. We were praising Him. We centered our lives for one week on His crucifixion. And then what? It ends. Does it? Many of us live in church as though the crucifixion was the climax, the end. That that was not Christ's goal, to merely come and die and be buried in a tomb and allow us to sing sad praises and songs for the rest of our lives. That wasn't the goal. His goal was to raise us from the bonds of sin and death, to give us new life. We all love the crucified Christ. We're all drawn to the crucified Christ. It was an incredible demonstration of God's love. But I wonder, do we love the resurrected Christ? Why aren't we as willing and devoted to praising and singing to the resurrected Christ? Why is the church usually empty during this time? We have to love the resurrection as much, if not more, than His cross. His resurrection makes our crosses palatable. Actually, His resurrection makes our crosses seem like an opportunity. An opportunity for a resurrection. In the resurrection, we can see God's nearness. We can see His glory, glory and we can experience His power in our lives. During Lent, we tend to focus on sin. We try to figure out how to get rid of it. And so we try to focus on repentance. During Lent, we're willing to fight our flesh, right? We're willing to not eat certain foods for two months. We're willing to fight our passions more than those two months than in any other time of the year. Then after Holy Week, many of us say, I tried. I gave it a really good shot. I got a really good few weeks there. Here you go, flesh. Take the key, take over from here. The keys to my life, my mind, my heart, you, you can have them back. And in this resurrection time, we need to be focusing not on sin, but life after sin. Life away from sin. Life separate from sin. Shouldn't we make even more effort during the holy 50 days with His resurrection power to be renewed and to be away from those sins? Hold on. In Romans, if you guys have your Bibles, which I know you always do, you always bring your Bibles to the Sunday adult meeting where we study the Bible, right? So uh, if you have your phones, we're going to read a lot in Romans. Romans chapter 6 talks about baptism, but there's very much correlation with baptism and resurrection. So he says this, we were buried with Him through baptism into death. Buried into death. That just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we should walk in newness of life. Christ died. Buried. Rose. He says, just like Him in our baptism, we died, we buried, and we rose, and we should have newness of life. That's what resurrection is. It's not returning to the old ways. There should be a change in us. If we are not going to change after Lent, 
all that struggle to become more like Him. If there's no change, then why even struggle? That's the whole purpose of it. Now, I'm going to say something that might sound a little unusual here. We tend to always say that Lent is a time where we store up spiritual growth for the whole year, right? We say, oh, we've got to be dedicated. And then what happens? We go to the Easter liturgy, and then what have we gained? Ten minutes after the liturgy, it's all gone. Do all of that effort for ten minutes? Like, we forget everything that we learned in Lent, so we're in and out, and we forget all of Holy Week. What? You do all that for ten minutes of benefit? Why? Is it worth it? How many of us since Lent have had these times of sincere devotion? Your prayers are even deeper after having seen not just a crucified Christ, but a resurrected Christ. How much time have you spent with the one whom you've seen give him life for you? Are you spending more time after seeing his... In the beginning of Lent, we were remembering he fasted for us. After he died... We remember that He died for us. Which should cause you to be more devoted? Do we read the Bible more? Look, during Lent, we're looking for His love, His mercy, His passion. What are we looking for now? Well, we read Revelation on, you know, Apocalypse Night, so like there's nothing else to read, right? We're done? Are our hearts burning for Him? When Christ, after the resurrection, He met the two disciples, He walked with them, He talked with them, He had communion with them. And what did they say? Our hearts were burning. Are our hearts burning with the resurrected Christ just like theirs? They should be. Now the sad thing is, is that for many of us, the time of resurrection is a time of defeat rather than victory. Everyone says Holy 50. Oh, it's always the time of victory. The whole purpose of Lent wasn't so that we could have drama in our services for one whole week during Holy Week. We walk the steps with Christ just as He walked to the cross. We walk the steps with Christ to the cross, but He didn't stop there. He went on to a resurrection. That's what we're supposed to do. Now you realize after He rose from the dead, He was different. He was changed. His own disciples couldn't recognize Him. He was different. Wouldn't that be a great testimony in our lives? If they, you people at work say, why do you keep fasting? You guys are doing all this fasting. Wouldn't it be a great testimony that after that whole Lent, you guys were different? That the fast and all that struggle made a change in you that they couldn't recognize you anymore? Wouldn't that be a great testimony? Isn't that what we should be doing? For a time, we are willing to put away our phones and our social media, and cut off our TV time, and our phone talking time. We're, we were willing to get rid of all that. I want to ask you, during Lent, when you were praying, was your prayer, God, please give me help to get through Lent? Was that the goal? God, can you help me for two months? Help me control all my desires, all my lusts, all my thoughts, all my passions. Can you help me just for two months? That, 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 that was all we wanted? Was that what you wanted? Is that what you were asking for? It seems sad. That's really not what we were trying to do. Our goal should have been to rise from the defeat of these sins, to be a new people. The problem is, most of us don't think to be different after Lent. We should. It, we should. So this is kind of what happens during Lent. And I'm going to talk about why we're not victorious. What do we do during Lent? We allow our sins to hibernate for two months. We let our desires, our thoughts, our habits, we put, them, we put them in a cage for two months. And then we want to rise, like we want to resurrect, like that's the goal, right? I have a question. What happens, when, when did Christ rise? Was it after like a long nap? He took like a retreat for a couple of months, came back, said, okay, I'm back. Was that the resurrection? What was required for the resurrection? Death. The only way that he could rise, anyone impressed with someone rising when they didn't die? Okay, you woke up from your nap, hey, I'm, I wrote, no. What is important and what he wanted to show us that a resurrection comes after a death. A death is necessary for there to be a resurrection. 
So let's go back to Romans. He says, if we've been united together in the likeness of his death, if you have gone through that death, we shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. He says, if you go through the death, there will be a resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified. Our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with. Done away with sounds like done, crushed, killed that we should no longer be slaves of sin, for he who has died has been freed from sin. If you die, then you can be free. There's a death and then a resurrection, and that's our problem. And that's our problem. We were never willing to put to death all those sins. We were willing to let them hibernate See, I just got to get through Lent. I'm not allowed to do this stuff during Lent. But afterward, come on. You can, I'll take you back. And sometimes what happens is we plunge deeper. Now I want to ask you, for those of you who are hunters, probably none of you, but um, what happens when you catch a lion, you put him in a cage for a long time with no food? When you let him out, he's seeking to devour. And unfortunately, that's what a lot of us did. We put him away for two months and we tried to control him for a while and we didn't kill it. Now Christ did not leave heaven, become a man, go through the cross for two months a year of some control for our sins. That's not why He did it. He came to destroy sin. He came to give us the power of resurrection in our lives. He wants us to be able to overcome that we would be free from the power of sin and death. He wants our resurrection, not just His. He already had life. He didn't come for Him to have more life. He he was the source of life. He came so that we could have that newness of life. So, this is written on a wall in some uh, monastery on on Mount Athens. If you die before you die, then you won't die when you die. What does that mean? If you die to yourself, if you put to death the deeds of the flesh, that when your body dies, you need to do that before your body dies, so that when your body dies, you won't die an eternal death. You have to die to your old self, to your sins, before your body dies, so that when your body dies, you don't die the eternal death. You will have eternal life. So, Colossians 3 is a very nice chapter about resurrection. So if you guys want to go back, it's a few books after Romans. He's saying, if then, and he's speaking to Christians, if you were raised with Christ, meaning if you've resurrected with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is sitting. So now he's talking about a change of mindset. He says, set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. He says, for you died. He's talking to the Christians like, you've died and now you've been resurrected. So this death is important. So then he says, in verse 5, he says, Therefore, put to death. He's giving you the command. If you've risen, that means you have to put to death these things. Put to death the members which are on earth, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, covetousness, which is idolatry. Idolatry. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sins of disobedience. There has to be a putting to death. How? What does that mean? Sounds difficult, right? But St. Paul tells us back in Romans, if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your bodies through His Spirit. He says, Jesus Christ, the greatest act that ever happened in the history of mankind, that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. Nothing greater. Did it by what? He did it by the Holy Spirit in Him. He says, the Holy Spirit that did that is the same Holy Spirit that is in you. That same Holy Spirit is in you? So then is there power to overcome sin? Absolutely. So two verses later he says, If you live according to the flesh, you're going to die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, then you will live. This is not like a willpower kind of thing. I'm just going to try my hardest. 
You failed before. You think you're going to do it without God? No way. He came because you couldn't do it without God. So the only way we will do it is by the Holy Spirit. You have to, how do you put things to death? You have to continue to starve them. You have to cut off their life source in order for them to die. What happened during this season, the Holy 50 Days? We've got cookies and chocolate and barbecue this and barbecue that everywhere you go. And you are stepping on stuffed grape leaves in the kitchen and you're thinking every time you find an M&M in some corner of your office or on the floor, you're like, this is manna. Like God is sending me M&Ms from heaven. This is the answer to my prayers. And then we wonder why things are not working. How come I'm not becoming more holy? Because the food is around you everywhere. You're like, I wonder why I don't have self-control. You don't send an alcoholic to a bar to see if they've overcome it. You say, stay away as much as you can. It was working for us much better when we cut things out. When we cut out the browsing on our social media, we probably didn't feel as controlled as much slaves to our social media. For those of us who are tempted by things we see on our phone, lustful images, whether it be on the phone or computer, maybe we were setting internet blockers to get rid of that stuff. They need to stay on. They don't come off once the Holy 50 happens. Alcohol, for those of us who have alcohol issues, it has to be removed from the house. you got to starve it. you got to cut it off. You have to kill the things that were killing us. I didn't have this um, verse on my PowerPoint, but I want you to look in Romans 6 again, if you're still there. <coughs> verse 21, I'm going to read it to you. He says this. He says in verse 21, What fruit did you have in the things of which you are now ashamed? See, those things that we were dealing with before, they were bringing us shame. He's like, what was the fruit of it? The fruit of it was shame. Was there any other benefit? And he says, and then what? He says, for the end of those things is what? Death. If you don't kill the things that are killing you, what's going to happen? It's going to kill you. You have to kill those things. You can't just leave them around or leave them close to you. They have to be cut away from your life with a sharp knife. There are some relationships, some habits, some places we go, some people we hang out with, that every time you do that or go there or be with those people, they bring you down. That doesn't help you. That doesn't lift you up. We said, Christ, St. Paul said, let, set your mind on those things which are above. You have to start focusing on the heavenly part of you. For those of us who maybe image is what brings us down, and we're always looking at our outward image, what we need to be start, start focusing is not on the flesh, but on the heavenly part of you. No lazy nights. During Lent, we didn't have lazy nights, right? Okay, i got to read, i got to pray, I'm going to do my, my matanias. What happens during the Holy Spirit? Oh, lazy nights. Do you guys remember that song, Who Let the Dogs Out? <laughs> you did. You are. You're letting the dogs out. What do you expect to happen? We say this in our prayer. We've been given the authority to trample on the serpents and scorpions and every power of the enemy. We've been given that authority. Why are we living in defeat? It requires a mindset change, a resurrected mind. Set your mind not on the things on the earth, but the things of heaven, on our Lord Jesus Christ. The Holy 50 Days, it's not, believe it or not, it's not about food. It's about our risen Lord who died and rose again. 50 days focusing on the risen Lord. So he gives us more advice in chapter 6 of Romans. He says, likewise, reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin. He says, be dead when it comes to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. You guys know the story of St. Augustine, right? St. Augustine lived a very debauchery life. He was, he had affairs, he had, you know, all kinds of sins in his life. He was living a very evil life. But then he changed. He changed and became Christian and a very devout Christian. Well, one of the ladies whom he had a relationship with before, 
came searching for him. So she came, she found him, she came to his house, knocked on the door, and he opens. He says, she said, he said, who are you looking for? She says, I'm looking for Augustine. You know what he said? He's dead. He's dead. When sin came knocking on his door, he was dead to the sin. He could not obey it. He could not go back to it. He had died. So guess what? The woman that he had an adulterous affair with was nothing to him because he had died to it. We're still, you know those sins that are still like you still want that? That needs to be killed. It needs to be crushed. So that it has no power over you. He says, stop presenting yourselves as instruments of righteousness to sin. You know there are certain things, certain places, certain people, certain you know, websites, whatever, that is going to lead you there. He says, don't present yourself to them, but present yourself to who? Present yourself to God as being alive from the dead. Present yourself to God as being, I'm alive. I'm presenting myself to who? To God and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. So when you wake up in your morning, God, I am yours. We just celebrated Christ purchasing us on the cross. He purchased us. We are His. He freed us. So we present ourselves in the morning to obey God. Not to Satan, not to the lust of the flesh. When you wake up in the morning, you have a choice. Who are you going to obey? So wake up in the morning and pledge your obedience. Again, what fruit did you have in those things which you are now ashamed? There's a great verse in 2 Corinthians 5.17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Brand new. New person. And the old things have passed away. The old stuff is gone. All things have become anew. It should make a difference in our lives and in our decisions. This is the resurrected mind. I am am His. That's the resurrected mind. You don't forget that He died on the cross to purchase you. You no longer belong to yourself. He freed you from slavery to sin to be slaves, not in a bad way, but to righteousness. If Holy Week meant something, and if Christ's sacrifice on the cross meant something, let it not be an emotion. Let it be a commitment that comes with a decision. I'm His. He purchased me with His own blood. It meant something. It means my whole life. Because I'm His and He is mine, I will present myself to Him. We need to work on putting to death certain deeds in our lives. That's kind of what I want to leave you with. If you don't put them to death, you're going to let the dogs out again and they're going to come after you. The Holy Spirit is what brings change in us. We have to change from the mindset of satisfying our flesh to obeying the Spirit, submitting to the Spirit, not suppressing, not quenching the Spirit or grieving the Spirit. We enjoyed living spiritual lives during Lent. It was fun. We enjoyed it. We felt refreshed. We felt lightened. We felt like we were changing, becoming new. If it was so much pleasure then, why would you give it up for something that leads to your shame? Last verse. Now, as much as there was a putting to death, the putting to death doesn't work on its own. In the same chapter where St. Paul is talking about Colossians, set your mind on things above. If you've raised with Christ, he says this. After you put to death those members, he says this. As the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on. You put to death certain things, but you have to exchange it. You can't be passive. Put on something fitting for a Christian. Tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another, forgiving one another. It, and then in verse 14 says, but of all things do what? Put on love. So you see, there's, we always focus on the sin where there's the killing of the sin, but we're not just not sinners. We're always probably going to be sinners, but we need to be Christ bearers. We need to be Christians. We need to resemble Him. We have to start focusing. I want to live a virtuous life. I want to be different. I want to be the forgiver at work. I want to be the patient one. I want to be the helper when no one is looking. I want to do the things around. I want everyone to be happier because I'm there. Because I am serving my Jesus Christ. I'm going to work acts of righteousness. Resurrection time is the holiest time of the year. It should be. It can be. And this is what characterizes us as a Christian. A life of resurrection. This is who we are. 
This is what we need to strive to be. We are resurrected people. May God give us all a new mind, a new attitude, a new heart, and a new way of life. May God be glorified in your lives. Christ is risen. And you will be risen. Truly, you will be risen. Let's stand up and pray. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. Our dear Lord, God and Savior, Jesus Christ, we thank you that you demonstrated your love for us, but not just your love, you demonstrated your power, that if anyone is against you, no one can stand up against you, nothing is impossible with you, that you could conquer death, you could conquer sin, and not just for you, but you conquered it for us. I thank you so much, dear Lord, because we're weak without you. We're nothing without you. We had no hope without you. And now we have someone to hold on to, to look to, to strengthen us, to lift us up, to give us that victory that we hear about. I pray for my brothers and sisters standing here before you. I pray, dear Lord, that you give us the ability to kill those things that are trying to kill us. Help us, O oh Lord, by your Spirit, change bit by bit our minds and our hearts. I pray, dear Lord, that we would really embrace the heavenly promise, that we would lift our minds and let not the things of the earth bother us at all. Because this is not where we're staying. We're coming to the kingdom. I know you're preparing it for us. Help us throughout this way. Lead us throughout our way into your kingdom. Bless these people that are seeking and desiring you and that truly do love you. They just need your help and your grace and your mercy and your love. In our session, our, our beloved Mother St. Mary and all your saints, hear us when we, your children, together with one voice, call our dear Heavenly Father, saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Through Christ Jesus our Lord, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Once again, happy Mother's Day to all the women that are here and attending with us. Hope you have a great day.